Okay, Harold, bring them on in. Let's come on in and get settled down, and we'll get going. Okay, as they keep coming in, we'll we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Good to see everybody tonight. If we have any uh, new visitors here, if you'd raise your hand, we'll get you a little packet. I don't don't see any. Okay, let's all stand together as we worship. After the second song, you may be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we, as always, we thank you for this place to come, Lord, that we could hear the truth. Father, we thank you that we can worship together and, and be in one accord in our hearts towards you. We pray, Lord, as we worship and, and listen to your message that our minds and our hearts are focused on you. Lord, and just... Uh, we welcome you in this place, Lord, and we know you're here with us, and I just pray, Lord, as Ron brings the message that uh, our hearts are touched and we can relate and just take take and give back out in the community. So, Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
great name, the power of Jesus Christ that saves men and women of their sins and gives us eternal life. And Lord, we thank you for a place to meet, Lord, and for your word tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Why don't you stand and greet one another? Okay, let's come on in. (laughs) Welcome to Calvary Chapel. If you need a Bible or a bulletin, raise your hand. Men's breakfast is this, where are you, this Saturday at 8 a.m. Yes. <laughs> Let's open up to Genesis chapter 1. As we journey through the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, we got as far Is verse 8, had a little bit of signs, we'll have a little bit more tonight. Genesis chapter 1, verse 9, then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And so it was so, and so God called the dry land earth and he gathered together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herbs that yield seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And so it was. And the earth brought forth grass and the herbs yielded seed according to its kind and tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And so the evening and the morning were the third day. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this night that we can come together. Lord, to have a place to meet and to worship you and to fellowship. Thank you, Lord, for what you'll do in our hearts tonight by creation. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we have, uh, let us, uh, in verse 9, So God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into how many places? Okay. How many places? One. So we have one place for all of the continents there together. Now, the secular uh, name for that is Pangea. How many of you have heard of Pangea? What is wrong with you people? (laughs) It's just a big fancy word that means all the landmass together. 
Now, it does not take a genius, it does not take you to be an evolutionary scientist to believe that the continents fit together because they fit together quite well. And so all the land mass was in one group, the sea was in the other, and then after the flood or during the flood, um, that's when it broke apart and it, now you might be thinking, okay, now how in the world during the flood can that all break apart and then be separated? Listen, remember what I said in Genesis 1.1? In the beginning, God created. If you can believe that, then you can believe that in a year's span of time, all of those continents broke, to, broke apart. All of the mountain ranges were created. And what we know as a planet currently is that what we see today. And so, in verse 11, he said, Let the earth bring forth grass, And the herbs that yield seed and its fruit trees that yield fruit according to its kind whose seed was in itself on the earth and so it was. Would you note with me that all of this happened, the grass of the green uh, fields and the trees, this happened before the sun was created because that was created on the fourth day. Now, Let's flash back a little bit for science. I know, for some of you, it's a ways back. Photosynthesis. I actually said that word right. It's a big fancy word, which means the plants take what the light is and create it into energy, right, and create the molecules to get that thing going. If you don't have sun, what don't you have? You you don't have anything growing. But how can we have on the third day plants and yet no... Sunlight Again, from last week, uh, we were talking about how uh, that the light that was created was much more than just visible light. There was something else to it. Now, those who proposed these days of creation were not literal days, but excess, are successful ages of slow evolutionary development have a real problem here, don't they? What's the problem? Well, it's hard to explain how plants and all vegetation could grow and thrive in eons of time. You see their little problem? You see, I believe God anticipated, well, because he's God, all of their arguments. And so you can't have millennia of time in between day one, day two, day three. You know what, God, when he says, It was the first day, you know what it was? An actual 24-hour period of time, and we need to remember that. Please, from last week, take your evolutionary thinking and take it outside. Don't you dare bring that in the church, and don't you dare bring that into God's Word. If you were taught that, you don't believe what man has to do. As we'll see tonight, there there are so many holes in his thinking. Did I say that too strongly? Take it out the door. Don't you dare bring in man's philosophies in the church. That's a part of the problem we've got in the church right now. We've watered down God's word. We've taken the blood out of here. We don't want to offend. Listen, I could care less if I offend a paleontologist. I, I want to go on God's word. And remember, they don't have facts. It's all theory. As we'll see tonight, there's no fact of evolution. So, I have a little problem. Many wonder again how the sun, the moon, and the stars were created on the fourth day when light, including day and night, were created on the first day. Again, many suggest the problem is solved by saying the heavenly bodies were first created on the first day, but were not significantly visible or not finally formed until the fourth day. But Revelation tells us there's a day coming when there won't be any sun, any moon, any stars. It says, and God and his lamb give light. It's, so it's no different from here back in Genesis chapter 1. Also, it says that the earth brought forth grass, the herbs that yield seed, and the trees that yield forth fruit, whose seed is in itself. These plants were created not as seeds, but as full-grown plants, each bearing its own seed and its kind. These were created as mature plants, having the appearance again of age. So the, the universal question, what came first? The chicken or the egg? What does Genesis prove? Chicken. That's why everything tastes like chicken. 
Notice again, according to its kind, this phrase appears ten times in chapter one. It means God allowed variation within a kind, but something of one kind will never develop into another kind. We're going to look at that today. Last week I threw out two big words, macroevolution and microevolution, and, and I will define both of those tonight. But you'll see, after its kind, that will be a theme that goes on. Again, he said, let us bring forth grass. Now, some in Colorado have, th- have taught this to be marijuana <laughs> and some other states. See, God made grass, man. I, and now, listen, there's a lot of people that justify that God made, you know, <laughs> pot, and therefore we should bust down and have a grand old time. But God also created hemlock. And hemlock is a natural plant, but it's also very poisonous. Go smoke that. You see, not everything that God created was for the purpose uh, that it was designed for. And man, as we'll see even tonight with sex, has taken it and changed it into something that it wasn't supposed to be. So let's get off the grass, man. Verse 13, and so that evening and the morning were the third day, and God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, would you note with me, for days and for years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, And the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament or the expanse of the heavens to rule over the night and to rule over the day and over the night and divided the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And so the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So here we now have God creating the sun and the moon and the stars. God makes all of these. Since the beginning, man has used God's provision of the sun, moon, and stars to mark and measure the time and direction. Again, notice he tells us that there are four times and season. When God set the lights in the heavens to be for a sign, we know them as the zodiac. That's man's view. But in in the book of Job, it was called the Maseroth. That's the biblical uh, idea of that. But the zodiac is a very common uh, idea of the different stars and the different constellations. And for thousands upon thousands of years, man knows these. Reading from uh, William McDonald's commentary, he says, The sequence of the zodiac is the same in every language and culture. Even if the specific names of the constellations have changed, also we know the figures of the constellations suggest that they don't even look like the things that they suggest them to be. He said, yet the names for the figures of the constellations are all the same in every culture. This points to a common pre-Babel beginning for all things before the truth of the constellations were corrupted or in our, for our purposes became what we know as the zodiac. So when we get to the Tower of Babel, we'll get that. Remember, at this point, man's going to be created today. We'll see that. There is one language. There is one tongue. That will continue all the way to the Tower of Babel. All of these creation events are going to be passed down to each generation inside those Genesis chapter 1 through 11. And so after the Tower of Babel, each one of those people are going to take those creation accounts. That's why we have a creation account all over the world. That's why we have the constellations are consistent in every single culture. Now, astrology is a satanic corruption of God's original messages in the stars. And so, a message outlining his plan of redemption in the stars, the enemy tried to corrupt that. So because astrology is corruption, it is to be avoided always by man from Isaiah chapter 47. And every time I get to this point, I need to make it clear. If you're reading your horoscope, repent, stop, don't do it ever again. That's it. No Jane Dixon for you. That's a flashback. (laughs) 
No ast astronomy, fine. The Maserat, fine. No astrology. It isn't there to guide you. That is the enemy always taking what God has created and taking people in a different direction, always. Would you know with me that he made the stars also? With all the other stars in our universe, we often wonder if there is life on other planets. How many of you, don't be shy, have ever thought, I wonder if there was life somewhere else? I wonder if we're the only thing. Is there a, another creation that God made, <laughs> one that was successful? <laughs> That their Adam and Eve didn't blow it? When you take into account all the necessity for the substance of life that we know, look, well, let me break down the statistics for you. Taking into account the factors such as galaxy type, star location, star age, star mass, star color, distant from the star, axis tilt, rotation period, Surface gravity, tidal force, magnetic field, oxygen quality in the atmosphere, oxygen pressure, and 20 other important factors, the probability of all 33 occurring at one place and at one planet is 10 to the 42nd power. <laughs> I know. What does that mean? What is 10 to the 42nd power? Well, the, the number of possible planets in the universe is only 10 to the 22nd power. What did I just say? It's mathematically impossible. Everybody got that? I mean, Star Trek's cool. Star Wars uh, has nothing to do with the Bible. God created a unique, privileged planet. We live on that planet. Again, I mentioned the privileged planet from last week. T take a rent to it. We've got it for purchase. It will describe all of this. At one time, the U.S. government spent $100 million a year looking for extraterrestrial ter intelligence. It probably would have been wiser for them to spend the money cultivating intelligence in Washington instead. $100 million a year, they were looking for little green guys. Now, I actually think that one of the um, things that's going to happen when the church is gone, because we've been so indoctrinated into this ET phenomenon as a culture since Roswell, right? I believe that it's demonic. I don't think they're from outer space. I think they're from inner space. And so when the church is gone, I can imagine this. Because there will be such great deception during the tribulation, I can imagine that the enemy, the, the father of lies, the devil, landing some kind of craft on the White House lawn and out pops a couple of green men and, we, and they say, listen, we took care of those Christians for you. And now you can advance in your next evolutionary state. And what is the world going to go? Well, that makes sense. Because we have been for the last 60 years talking about little green men coming out of spaceships, right? It's demonic. It has nothing to do with God. Well, let's get away from outside of our universe and come back. And so, um, 20, there it is. Then God said, let the waters abound with the abundance of living creatures and let the birds fly in the earth across the face of the firmament or expanse and so God created great sea creatures. What does great sea creatures mean? They're great. It's Wednesday night here. We're not complicated. Great sea creatures means, hey, they're pretty great. You know how big a blue whale is? It's bigger than a bus. How would you like to swim next to that? And by the way, we're going to talk about later on, not, not necessarily tonight, uh, how dinosaurs, there are some uh, dinosaurs that were bigger than the blue whale. Amazing. Like the length of trains, they were so big. And so there was an abundance of great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, which in the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good 
And God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the sea and let the birds multiply on the earth. And so the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And so see, we see these great varieties of birds and sea creatures. They were created at the same time, not evolving slowly over millions of years. Even though the plant life were created before animals, animals did not come out of plant life. Now, among the diversity of animals, many share similar structures. Birds and reptiles and uh, mammals and so forth have similar structure. This argues at least that there is a common designer because a common designer has, you know, if he's going to make this this vertebrae, you're going to see a vertebrae in most everything else. That's a common designer. Again, it did not come from the primordial ooze or one so-called single cell. It came from a designer. Now, note with me, we're going to now look at this according to their kind. All animal life was created according to its kind. God deliberately structured plenty of variation within its kind, but one kind does not become another kind. Got that? We're going to break it down. Now, this is the, the main argument of evolution that one kind becomes another kind. I just wanted to simplify evolution. Darwinian evolution says that you can go from something that is not something of a, this kind and go into another kind. So a, their idea is that the cat kind or dog kind can become into an elephant kind. That's their thinking. But that's not what God says. Again, For example, the structure of dogs are universal. Anybody figure that out? I have a wiener dog at home. Actually, it's at my brother's house. Thank you uh, for the next day. So, but it's a lot different than a Great Dane, right? Is it still a dog? Is it a cat? Okay. If I breed it enough times, will it become a mouse? Oh. But the smart people, that's what they think. If I give myself a million years, we will breed something completely different. So there are two different terms in evolution. One is macroevolution, and one is microevolution. This is the definitions. Macroevolution refers to major evolutionary changes over time. This is what Darwinian evolution believes. They believe that the origin of a new type of organism from previously existing but different ancestral types. Examples of this would be a fish descending from an invertebrate animal or whales descending from a land mammal. The evolutionary concept demands these uh, bizarre changes. And they so try Oh, they try hard, don't they? And they'll look at a whale and they'll say, see these little bones over here in the corners? Those are really legs. Don't you dare be fooled by that. By the way, their conceptual artists are amazing, right? They can take one bone and make this whole animal out of that. That's called Hollywood. That's not science. That's just a really good artist. That's macro evolution. Now, the Bible teaches microevolution, which is, it refers to varieties within a given type. Changes happen within a group, but that descendant is clearly of the same type of ancestor. This might be better called variation or adaptation, but the changes are horizontal. They're not vertical. Such changes might be accomplished by natural selection in which a trait within that present variety is selected as the best for a given set of conditions or accomplishments by artificial selection such as a dog breeder creating, you know, or those cats with no hair. Are those creepy? I mean, we won't even go down the creep factor. But we we see all of these different dogs, right? Can a chihuahua, who was in Mexico, survive 
in Alaska. Not without a really big coat. Now, is a husky suited for Mexico? No. You see, they adapted in their regions. And when we get off the boat in a couple of chapters, we'll see that there is plenty of time for those adaptations. We've had several thousands of years of adaptation. We've had birds that have longer beaks so it can get into a certain flower, right? All these kinds of adaptations. So you might think to yourself, like the rest of the world has been programmed to think, well, doesn't the fossil record show these creatures slowly evolving into their existing state? No, but but wait a minute. That's what the world claims. The world claims that, no, in the fossil record, we see this. Most people are unaware that Darwin's strongest opponents were not clergymen of his day, but the fossil experts. Darwin admitted that the state of the fossil evidence was, and I quote, the most obvious and grave objection which can be urged against my theory. Now, we have had over 100 years uh, to prove, it's, what, it's over 100. Uh, we've had over 100 years to prove Darwinian evolution by his own statement. Almost all of the eminent paleontologists and, all of, and most of the geologists today have unanimously, often vehemently maintained that the species that they see in the records the fossil records do not change. You see, the fossil record is marked by two great principles. First, status, which means most species are unchanged in their documented history. The way they look when they first appear in the fossil record will be the way they look in the last appearing of the fossil record. Got that? Now, these are real scientific terms. Again, that status Secondly, is something called sudden appearance, which means in any local area, a species does not rise gradually, but appears all at one time and fully formed. Now, to play this out, there's a place in Wyoming called the Bighorn Basin. Now, in the Bighorn Basin in Wyoming, it contains a continuous record of fossil deposits for which the secular geologists say is 5 million years in length, right? Now, you would think that when they found this 5 million, un, they were just stoked, right? If we look hard enough in here, we are going to find the evolutionary missing link. But the problem is they haven't found anything. In fact, for over 100 years, secular Darwinian evolutionists have been looking for bones. The British Museum is filled with tens of millions of bones and not one evolutionary link between a this kind and this kind. At this point, we should have one. Don't think that they just started digging in the 60s. They've been digging since the 1800s. For bones. Not one link, not one example of a macro evolution going from one species to another. Not one. Is that a big deal? Anybody? Why is it a big deal? Listen, we've been digging for a long time and not one. There's some Every once in a while, God's humor just comes out, doesn't it? And a couple of years ago, they found a bone that had bone marrow in it. Now, I don't want to be the smart guy here for a minute. But fossilized bones, that doesn't happen. Got it? They found blood uh, deposits inside of that. It can never be a million trillion years old. Got that? Oh, it made them so mad, they hid that faster than anything. So the next time you talk to someone about the billions and billions of years old and bones that they've had in these 
missing links, you say, well, what about the dinosaur bone that had actual tissue in it? You see, if the dinosaurs went away some 50 million years ago, you can't have that survive for 50 million years. Everybody got that? It's impossible. So at the end of the day, what do we believe? Verse 24, according to its kind. That's what we believe. And so, verse 24, again, let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, every creeping thing of the beasts of the earth, and each after its kind. And so God made the cattle of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, everything that creeps on the earth, and according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. And so on the fifth day, the creation of God, he made the birds and the sea animals, and he made these land animals as well. Well, let's get to the most exciting portion of creation. Anybody know what that is? It's verse 26. I mean, isn't that kind of important? Listen, animals are cute and all that, and they taste really good. But the creation is about man, and that's important. We'll see that. So it says in verse 26, Let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and over all the creeping things that creep on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them male and female and created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish, over the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so here we have, let us make man in our image. Again, it is plural. It is consistent with the idea that there is one God and three persons. We know that to be the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. An understanding of man, of who man is, begins with us knowing what we are made of and then of the image of God. Man is different from every other order of created being because he was created consistently with God. This means that there is an unbridgeable gap between human life and animal life, that there are biological similarities to certain animals, but we are distinct in moral, intellectual, and spiritual capabilities. Now, this is going to be important. In fact, on Sunday, we're going to talk about this very topic, how man wants to worship the creation rather than the creator. PETA loves this chapter until we get to man, right? And they're like, oh, there's man. He ruins the whole thing. They would rather, guys, have no human being at all on this planet. Don't you dare be fooled. This means that there is also a gap between human life and angelic life. Nowhere are we told that the angels were made in the image of God. Angels cannot have the same kind of relationship of love, that of fellowship with God that we can. This means that the incarnation was truly then possible because God in the second person of the Trinity could really become a man because although deity and his humanity are not the same, they were compatible. Do you see that God could not come in the form of a buffalo? He did not make the buffalo in his image. Do you see that? Who is most important? It is man. This means that human life has intrinsic value, quite apart from the quality of life experienced by any individual because human life is made in the image of God. And if the human life is made in the image of God, it has value. All life matters, not just black lives matter. All life matters. Whatever color it is, and we're going to see that God is an amazing creator. He created all the colors that we see today. All the races today are inside of creation in that DNA. In fact, another evolutionary scientist came out recently after looking at the DNA and was blown away, he realized there's no way this could have happened over millions of years. It's too complex. 
he became a creationist. He says, there's no way. It's too amazing. Again, let's make man in our image, it says. There are specific things in it that shows man that they were made in the image of God. Man alone has a natural uh, countenance looking upward. Man alone has a variety of facial expressions. Man alone has a sense of shame expressing in it itself in a blush. Man alone speaks, except for one little donkey in the, in the Old Testament. Other than that, when, I mean, would you not freak out if your dog said, listen, what's with the puppy chow? You know, can't. Yes, I would freak out. By the way, if we're evolving, shouldn't, shouldn't some animal have talked by now? We've had billions of years. Man alone possesses personality, morality, and spirituality. Man alone. Your dog did not say, can I go to church with you tonight? I really need to get close to my God. He doesn't care. Listen, all you have to do is watch a dog for like, 10 minutes, and you'll figure out they're the most disgusting thing, and then I let them lick my face. (laughs) Let's think twice about that. In our image, there are three aspects to the idea that we are made in the image of God. It means man possesses personality. It means knowledge, feelings, and will, the will of man. There is no will of the buffalo. There is no will of your dog. He doesn't have a will. Listen, I, I, I apologize. There's no dogs in heaven. All we know is the only animal is a horse. Stop as a people getting so wrapped up around animals. Listen, you may say, listen, my dog, my cat, they know me. They love. That may be all true, and God made them as companions. But we need to be careful about that. Do you know we spend over $2 billion a year just on animals? And those sweaters. I vowed never to have an animal with a sweater. You know what I have? An animal with a sweater. (laughs) Life's over. It also means that man possesses mortality. An animal doesn't know that it's not going to live forever. It doesn't know that. We are able to make moral judgments and have a conscience. Right? Right? A dog doesn't think, oh, I ate your cookie. I'm so sorry. (laughs) If I leave a plate at any range of this height, it's gone. If any food is on that dog bump, gone. You could turn your back and it ate, gone. He doesn't turn around, I'm so sorry I ate that. I'm just a dog. I can't handle it. Again, it means human possesses spirituality. Man is made for communion with God. It is on the level of spirit we commune with God. Jesus said man must be, the time is coming that God is wanting those to worship him in spirit and in truth. Listen, the animal kingdom, as we're going to see in a minute, is made for our dominion. Would you note that in verse 26? They, they, They would have dominion over them. In verse 28, to have dominion over them. Before God ever created man, he decreed that we would have dominion over the earth. Man's preeminence of the created order and his ability to affect his environment is no accident. It is part of God's plan for life on planet earth. Man is at the top of the food chain. Tonight, we're going to see that man is on top of the vegetarian food chain but that doesn't last very long. Man is preeminent. Man is the most important thing on planet Earth from a biblical perspective. Everybody got that? Listen, the condor is wonderful, but when it comes to a condor versus a man, the Bible says it's a man. I love whales. Love dolphins. I mean, mahi-mahi is some of the best tasting ever. 
so I don't want to deplete them. I want to be smart about that. Dominion means that we manage what God has given us, right? We're going to see, not tonight, that God makes Adam a tiller of the land. He is a steward of the garden. He is in charge of the animals. So it is not that we just cut down every tree, that we eat everything that is out there. We have to manage it. We have to be good stewards. That's what it means to have dominion over it. Well, note with me in verse 27 too, he made them what? Male and female. This should not be construed to mean that Adam was originally some type of androgynous being, both a male and female. This passage of Genesis gives us an overall of God's creation of man. Genesis 2 will explain how God created male and female. The difference between man and woman, well, there's no accident that God created a male and female. Since he created them, the differences are good and meaningful. Can I say this again? God made male and female for a reason. They have different roles. It is good. Nothing that God creates is bad. It's good. If God created you a male, you know what you are? I think you're a male. Men are not women. And women are not men. One of the saddest signs of our culture's depravity is the amount of degree of gender confusion today. And can I say this as loudly as I possibly can? It's all from the enemy. It's a corruption of what God has created. It is vain to wonder if a man or a woman are superior to one another. A man is absolutely superior at being a man. A woman is absolutely superior at being a woman. But when a man tries to be a woman or a woman tries to be a man, you will have some problems in your society. Listen, I don't want to offend anybody, but I have no problem with men being firefighters. You know why? Because at, the, at, at 2 in the morning, and I'm upstairs, and I'm passed out, I want some guy so yoked that he could just, uh, and then jump out. That's what I want. But when the world says, oh, no, no, male and female, they're equal. No, they're not. You have different bone structures. Males have better upper body strength. That's how God made it. We don't say why. We just say that's how he did it. And we move on. Listen, women are better nurturers. Come to my house after three days of my wife gone. (laughs) Someone's about to die in my house. It's not me. They are better nurturers. Dads are not. That's just how it is. God created male and female. And what we have in this country is the devil winning the media game, saying that you can change who you were created to be. And let me tell you, the lie is so strong that when people start to change, the suicide rates are through the roof. That'll never come out. When the gender starts changing, when people go into the homosexual lifestyle, I found out this um, last week, the domestic violence in homosexual relations are three times the, the amount in a heterosexual. Three times. Never gets reported. Why? An agenda. See, we're we're corrupting that which God created, which was male and female. There are differences. There are strengths to both. That's why when God has the marriage, it is bringing one and another together. They have their strengths. They have their strengths. They come together, and what do they become? (laughs) Uh, They can become one. God's math is amazing. One plus one equals one. Doesn't mean two. There's not two people in your house anymore. There's one. We're going to get into that marriage next week. I'm sweating, Tim. Get me a hanky. Woo! 
I can't handle this topic of male and female. We've been dealing with feminism and this argument for so long, and it is deteriorating the country. Listen, are you saying, Pastor, how dare you say that I can't vote? Did, I, did anyone hear me say that? In fact, the Bible says Christianity ha- has male and female equal. It says there's no more Jew nor Gentile, nor male nor female, but all are one in Christ, which means in a biblical context, from a Judeo-Christian context, everyone in this room is equal. How about that? You want to take that to uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia? You want to take that to Mexico City? You want to take that to, I don't know, India or Japan? Do you see the point? It's only Christianity that has made the playing field exactly how it was back in Genesis. Now, as we'll see, that God has placed and put in a hierarchy for a reason, and it's his reason, it's not mine. It's not for me to say, it's not for you to say that you do or do not like it. You know what? Anytime you want to have a conversation with God about what you don't like, you call him on the phone. I'd love to hear that conversation, (laughs) because you'll be mute. That's what the Bible says, that when people stand before a holy God, there'll be nothing they'll be able to say. Now, would you note with me as well, he says, be fruitful. He didn't say, be fruit. (laughs) Let that sink in. Well, pastor, I just feel like I'm a raspberry. (laughs) He said, be fruitful. Now, there's another lie from the enemy that is in the church. You're not to have kids. That may step on people's toes tonight. That's not biblical. God said, be fruitful and multiply. Now, that's not condemnation. I'm not bringing that out. I'm simply giving you what God's word said. It said, be fruitful and multiply. Inside of that, God raises up godly offspring. Be fruitful. You see, man cannot fulfill God's plan for him on the earth unless he populates it first. Now, God gave mankind a desire for sex, which would make the populating of the earth um, pretty quick. All right? He built in. Now, think about this. We could be Vulcans and have sex every seven years. That's why I don't like Vulcan. Or how about in heat? Aren't you glad that uh, as humans, we don't have a heat cycle? Maybe you only have sex once every four or five months. And then, ladies, you have a litter. (laughs) I like this plan better. He built in certain things into human sexuality so that the man and the woman would come together, that they would be fruitful, that it would be enjoyable. It would be something that God said, listen, I know they're going to want to do this again. Got that? Because if you look at the animal kingdom and what they do, that's certainly not what God had created for us. Now, many have thought that being fruitful and multiplying was God's only main purpose for sex, but this isn't the case. Again, the primary reason for God creating sex was to contribute to the bonding of the one flesh relationship, and we'll get to that next time. Where are we? We're almost done. Verse 30, also to every beast of the earth, to every bird that is in the air, to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. And so God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good, and so the evening and the morning were the six days. So In the beginning, God created man, and I can't believe I'm about to say this, as a vegetarian. And yet, he created us with canine teeth. You got that? Why? So I could rip that lettuce better. No! 
so you can rip a piece of meat. You know why? God already knew that man was going to fall. He already knew that. And so when he made Adam, he said, man, Adam, you're going to have a steak in a few years. And it was good. God created Outbacks. It's in here somewhere. But in the beginning, there was a vegetarian diet. Now, I want to say that to say this. There are those who claim that if you have a vegetarian diet, somehow you're better than everyone else, that you're healthier. Now, listen, aside from all of the junk and the garbage we're putting into our food chain now with GMO and and hormones into the, the meat supply and all that. I'm not talking, I'm just talking about run of the mill biblical, you know, vegetarian and meat eater, fish eating later on. God created that first. Yes, that's what it was all about. He knew that man was going to sin. He put in those parameters so that when man's, I mean, think about this. When Adam sinned, do you think he grew canines that day? I don't think so. See, it was built in because God knew. We're going to see when they sin that God <laughs> um, takes an animal and he clothes them. Now, this is just my belief. It's not in the text, but I believe that there's two flank steaks sitting there too. This is what it cost for you. And so the peace offering was there. He made an atonement for their sin. He covered their bodies, as we'll see. But in the beginning... It was not so. Man was not given permission to eat of the flesh until we'll see a little bit later in Genesis. Well, read ahead chapter 2 for next week. We will get married next week. Woohoo! We will become one flesh next week, and we will see how all of this male and female stuff plays out in the creation account. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word and for this night and, Lord, for your creation, this beautiful creation that we see. The seas, Lord, we live by the sea. We're in awe of it. The mountains that we see, the birds of the air, the animals that are all around, the amazing fish and huge sea creatures, the heavens, Lord, the stars and the sky and the moon. Lord, that you created male and female to commune with you. That they would be body, soul, and spirit, just as you are three. So you created us as three. Lord, thank you. Again, thank you. Lord, we pray for our culture and our time. We pray for the church not to get sucked into this gender neutral. This gender neutral mess that's all through our country and through the world. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. And let, Lord, you would be glorified in our midst. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We'll sing this last song. The Lord bless you guys. And we'll see you on Sunday. Let's worship. is coming soon Call back the sin Wake up the same Let every nation Shout of your fame yes. Jesus is coming soon Like a bride Waiting for her groom We'll be at church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. 
Lord Jesus, come.